The Lord be with you. Our Lord is truly present among us on this Palm Sunday, and I do hope you were able to grab your palm from church this weekend, or perhaps if you live down south, you're able to just walk outside and grab one off the tree. But in any event, today is the day when we commemorate the triumphal entry of our Lord Jesus into Jerusalem, and it's the formal beginning of Holy Week. And on Holy Week, just a quick announcement, throughout this week, you'll be provided with a full complement of worship services and devotional aids and other prompts for how we as God's people can continue to live life together even as we have to be apart. So keep an eye on your inbox or on follow our Facebook page and also I want to encourage you if you haven't already to go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel here um, as there will be things regularly being added to it in addition to the worship services. You can now follow my daily psalmanac daily devotional where I take just a couple of minutes to read and reflect upon and offer back in prayer one of the Psalms. And so I encourage you to follow along with that. Now let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. I invite you to please stand for our hymn of invocation, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And if you've got your palm and you'd like, feel free to process around your living room.
order of service this morning is printed for you in your worship folder. If you haven't already done so, you can find a link to download it in the service notes below this video. Let's begin with confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Most merciful God, as the people of Jerusalem, with palms in their hands, gathered to greet your dearly beloved Son when he came into his holy city, grant that we may ever hail him as our King, and when he comes again, may go forth to meet him with trusting and steadfast hearts and follow him in the way that leads to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading for today comes from Isaiah chapter 50. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. But the Lord God helps me. Therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle lesson is from Philippians chapter 2. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard that he had done this sign. 
So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, number 430 in the hymnal, My Song is Love Unknown. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Enemy-occupied territory. That's what this world is. C.S. Lewis famously said that in his book, Mere Christianity, that we are living in enemy-occupied territory. And I don't think any of us would disagree. What we might disagree about, though, is the nature of that enemy. Who or what is that opponent to the people of God? Well, some would say it's, it's other people, whether those other people be politicians or the media or, God help us, snowbirds who are coming back up north. 
But then others would say, no, it's not any other people. Our opponent, especially in this moment, is the coronavirus. It's COVID-19. That's our true opponent. That's our true foe that we are fighting. That's the, the enemy that occupies our territory. I think in both of these cases, there's some truth to it. But our sights are being set too low if we think that's our fundamental enemy, whether it be other people, whether it be a virus or something else. No, our true enemy, you guys know full well. It's what St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's our real enemy, the spiritual forces of evil, Satan and his minions. That's our foe that we as the people of God continue to fight against, not only in this season of, of sheltering in place and quarantine, at all times. It doesn't have to do with a virus. It doesn't have to do with other people. It, all of these things can become tools or instruments of Satan, ways that he's able to pull the strings on the people of God. But they themselves are not what we're fighting against, friends. Our battle is not against flesh and blood or even microbes. Our battle is against the evil one. And I think especially in this time, we need to keep our eyes fixed on that spiritual battle. Make no mistake, it isn't just happening right now that the spiritual warfare is happening at all times. But I think that there's elements of this outbreak that have given us a heightened awareness of things that we cannot see of that unseen battle that is raging all around us, that's happening even now. We live in enemy-occupied territory. But what are some of the strategies that Satan uses? What, what are some of the, the different ways that our foe tries to get after us? Well, unfortunately, there's too many to list. But let me give you just three as we try to think about the nature of this battle for us right now. Loneliness, listlessness, and forgetfulness. First of all, loneliness. Satan, you know full well, loves to, to take the tack of divide and conquer. He wants to divide people, isolate us, separate us, because then he knows it's easier to get after us. When we don't have the, the power, the strength in the numbers as the people of God, we become much easier marks for him. You say, well, now would be a natural time for him to get after us. Yeah. Absolutely. That's why it's so important for us to push back on that, to recognize that in our loneliness, in our isolation, we can't allow ourselves to be alone. We have to find ways to be together even while we are apart. Because what Satan wants to do is to drive that wedge between each and every one of us, even while we are isolated and, and sheltered in place, and to use that to his advantage. It doesn't have to be so. We're fortunate to live in a time when we can still connect where we can still be with one another, even as we are right now across the World Wide Web. Don't allow loneliness to settle in. Give me a call. Connect with your fellow brothers and sisters. Make sure that Satan doesn't allow this time when we have to be divided to also be a time when we are conquered. So that's one strategy of his loneliness. A second one, though, maybe especially pertinent in this season, is listlessness. Now, listlessness is kind of a fancy word for laziness, but it goes deeper than that. It's not just laying around the house, which frankly, all of us are doing plenty of right now. It's that spiritual sloth that settles in. It's when not only am I kind of laying around, but it's when my soul has now become in a settled position of just bleh. That's listlessness. And look, I know I myself have, have written in recent weeks like, hey, to survive this quarantine, some days we just need to stay in our pajamas and sleep in. I still stand by that. But we can't allow that to be every day, first of all. And furthermore, we can't allow that to, to overtake and inwardly to overtake our sense of, of who we are and the life that we are called to live in Christ. It is imperative for us in this moment to continue to keep the rhythms of the faith, to continue to, to be vigilant in prayer and studying the scriptures in speaking and maintaining fellowship at a distance, calling one another, keeping in contact, all of those ways to battle against, to push back against that spiritual sloth, that listlessness that can so easily settle in and that Satan uses to draw us away from the Lord. And so there's that loneliness, the listlessness, and then thirdly, forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. One of the real challenges, just from a mental health perspective, in a time like this, is people can lose a sense of, 
of orientation, of time, of structure, and you start to just forget things, our minds become a little bit um, atrophied, if you will. We need to maintain a fervent memory of faith. What Satan wants to lure us into is that spiritual amnesia. You see it over and over again in the scriptures in the Old Testament. The Israelites, they forget the Lord who saved them. They're wandering in the wilderness, and they start to think, you know what, this is so bad. Why didn't we just stay in Egypt? You know, we were eating pretty good there. And I think in the, in the midst of this wilderness of sheltering in place, some of us might be feeling the same kind of forgetfulness. Man! We've never had it so good than when we were able back in the, in the good old days. Don't allow this time to be a time to forget of the Lord and all that he has done for us. That even in the midst of this difficult, trying time, still he is with you and me. He has not forgotten us. He will not forget us. Let us not forget him. And you know what? That's why this day... Palm Sunday and this week, Holy Week, is especially important. And why it's important for you and me to continue to practice it, to commemorate it, to celebrate it in our own homes, with our families. Because if we forget that, if we say, well, what's the big deal? You know, if I can't get together at church, I'm just going to let it slide. It matters because it's these things that keep the embers of faith continuing to flicker, that keep the fire of faith burning hot, even in this time when we're not able to gather together. Palm Sunday is the pinnacle of this grand story that is unfolding through time. We need it desperately right now. I want to go back to C.S. Lewis again and that quote that I started out with. He goes on, he says, Enemy occupied territory, that is what this world is. And Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say, landed in disguise. See, Christianity, the whole story of the scriptures, is how our rightful king, Jesus, is returning to reclaim his throne. Satan is spoken of in some really stark and startling ways in the scriptures. In the New Testament, sometimes he's referred to as the ruler of the world, the prince of the power of the air, even in one place as the God, lowercase g, God, of this world. Our world continues to be in the thrall, in the grips of Satan ever since the fall into sin. But that's why the whole story of the scriptures is how our rightful king, Jesus, has come in order to reclaim that throne, to kick that usurper to the curb and reclaim this good creation for himself, to redeem his fallen people, to make them his own once again. He comes even, as Lewis says, in disguise. Well, how does he do that? Well, first of all, in the incarnation. He takes on our, our frail human flesh. St. Paul in our epistle reading today alludes to that. He says, The Son of God is equal with God the Father, but he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. The Son of God comes in disguise as one of us, born as a baby, raised as a peasant, in obscurity, in the backwaters of, of Palestine. But not only that, See, on Palm Sunday and throughout Holy Week, we see the lengths that this disguise of our Lord goes to as he clothes himself, cloaks himself in shame and in dignity. I mean, even today, Palm Sunday, here's the triumphal entry, we call it. The triumphal entry of the king who ambles in on a donkey. This is not the royal welcome that you would expect. Much less when that king goes to a cross and is cloaked in our sin. This is the incredible disguise of our king who has come to save us. He disguises himself, clothes himself in suffering and shame for you and for me. But he has done it all in order to reclaim his throne, to restore his kingdom. That's what the, the events of this week celebrate and commemorate. How our Lord Jesus, through his suffering, his death, and his resurrection, has restored his kingdom. But it has not yet come in full. You and I have been enlisted in this mission because it continues until Christ comes again, when he brings the kingdom of God in without remainder. And so Lewis continues by saying this, 
He says, this rightful king is calling us all to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. When you go to church, he says, you are really listening in to the secret wireless from our friends. That's why the enemy is so anxious to prevent us from going. Suggestive words, especially in this moment when we are not able to gather together. And it is like we are listening in on this secret wireless, or at least through our wireless internet. From our homes, still we are, are gathering together as the people of God, listening in on the good news, the message of our King Jesus, who is still launching this campaign of his kingdom and enlisting you and me into acts of royal resistance against Satan and his snares. But what does that look like? What does that campaign of the kingdom look like? What are, what are these acts of royal resistance? What's their character? What's, what's their nature? Well, I think we could take some inspiration here from the history of our own country during World War II. So toward the end of World War II, in 1944, the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, put out something that they called the Simple Sabotage Field Manual. The Simple Sabotage Field Manual. This was a real thing. And they were giving it out to the Allies in the event of a Nazi occupation. And the idea was, how can regular citizens, ma and pa, how can, how can the kids all be enlisted in this act of, of opposition, this resistance against this enemy occupation? But when you read it, when you, when you look at that field manual, it doesn't counsel great big acts. It doesn't tell people to take up arms and to you know, have kind of an anarchist cookbook with a, a bunch of explosives or anything like that. Instead, what it recommends is a thousand acts of small resistance. The examples that it gives are almost kind of funny. It says things like, well, misplace tools when you're uh, working. Make sure that, uh, you know, oh, over there, they're not going to be able to find. Where's the hammer? Where's the wrench? They're trying to work. They can't do it. It says uh, clog up all kinds of different machines, including toilets. I won't say anything more about that. <clears throat> and it even says, this is my favorite one, it says, look, if you're serving on boards, you're serving in the workplace, refer as much as you can to committees. Bureaucracy, this is your moment. <laughs> Through all of these small acts of resistance, the idea was that that's how we will prevail. It's not through one great big thing, but it's through all of the people working together in order to sabotage that occupying enemy. What does that mean for us as the people of God? What do these thousand acts of small resistance look like? It means that it's not a matter of us just doing one big thing, but that each and every one of us take responsibility as Christians, as followers of Jesus, to offer little clandestine cups of cool water, to scatter out those mustard seeds, those small things, those little gestures, those are the things that are part of the campaign of the kingdom, the onslaught of God's mercy still working in the world. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking. Well, wait a second. Pastor, are you telling us that we need to do acts of resistance against the government? We need to, to say, oh, wait a second, this shelter-in-place stuff, we shouldn't be doing that. We will resist. No. Let me be clear about this. Resistance doesn't just always mean, well, I'm going to resist the man. I'm going to go against the government. In this case, resistance looks like honoring the government, upholding the fourth commandment, shall honor your father and mother, including the ruling authorities, who have ordered us for good reason to stay sheltered in place. Right now, to resist Satan, our true enemy, and what he would try to do, which is to impugn the name of Christ, to bring shame and dishonor on our Lord and on the church, to re resist that, you and I need to honor the orders of our governor, of our government, and stay sheltered in place to, to abide by those rules, even when everything within us says, no, we want to continue to gather together, we want to, to get out and do as we please, we're not going to do it. Because we want to be faithful to Christ, to honor him. In that way, you're doing one of these small acts of resistance. But what else? What can that look like for us as the people of God? Well, for those of you with families, with kids, I think it's praying together as a family, reading the Bible to your kids, 
saying, look, it's such a blessing that we have a pastor, that we've got Sunday school teachers, but ultimately I need to take this responsibility of faith formation for myself, for my family. Now is a wonderful opportunity. If you haven't already made that a habit in your practice, in your home, in your family, to do it now as a small act of resistance. Some of those other ones are calling on friends and neighbors, checking up on them, keeping those bonds of connection like we talked about before. All of these little ways that we can do it, giving that the acts of kindness. If you're running to the grocery store, finding out, can I pick something up for someone else? Making sure that I'm wearing a mask, keeping my six feet of distance. All these small acts of resistance. And let me give you one more for today in particular, Palm Sunday. You've got your palms. So how about if today at noon, Eastern time, we were all to, to go out for a little bit of exercise, not to gather together, by ourselves and, and with our family to go on a little personal Palm Sunday procession just around your house or around your block. You could even sing all glory, laud, and honor if you're so inclined. And let's snap a picture of ourselves. You guys know me. I'm the old-fashioned guy, but if you're able, snap a selfie of yourself, of your family, and tag it. Send it to friends and other fellow believers. Tag our, our church with hashtag royal resistance. See, Satan wants to use this time in order to drive us apart, in order to weaken our faith. But the Lord would have us use it as a time for bolstering us, to building us up individually and as the body of Christ to continue this campaign of his kingdom, the mission that will continue until our king comes again and restores his kingdom in full. Look, guys, this is a, a trying season for us. It's a season of scattering. We're not able to be gathered together. But that doesn't mean that God isn't up to something. In fact, it's just the opposite. I'm sure that he is. One way I know that, throughout the history of the church, God has used seasons of scattering in order to expand his kingdom, in order to spread the good news. We've been studying the book of Acts in our Bible study, and you see it over and over again in the book of Acts. To give just one example, in chapter 8 of Acts, up to that point, all of the Christians, all of those early followers of the way, as it was called, they were stationed in Jerusalem, and they were gathering together as the people of God in Jerusalem, worshiping, praying, and serving one another. But in Acts chapter 8, after the first martyr, Stephen, it says that a great persecution was leveled against the church. And you think, oh no, what's going to happen now? It says all the people were scattered. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but all the rest of the believers were, were scattered to the four winds. What's going to become of the church? Is it all just going to collapse? Is it the death now of the people of God? By no means. Instead, as a result of that scattering, it goes on to say that the good news was being spread everywhere. We live in such a moment in the providence of God he has provided for this moment for us as the people of God to be scattered. It's not ideal. It's not my first wish. But God is using it in us individually and through us corporately as the church, as the body of Christ. He is blessing us through this, this blitz of blessing, small acts of resistance, this campaign of the kingdom of God that is continuing and ensuing through you and me. This week, Holy Week, it continues Christ is still risen from the dead. He is not going to be conquered. He is not going to be defeated. While we live in this enemy-occupied territory, we're not going to lose sight of who our true enemy is. We're not going to take our eyes off the ball, but we're going to remember that our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not even against viruses and diseases. Our battle is against the spiritual forces of evil. We will not resist. We will not relent. We will not give in. But instead... Through a thousand small acts of resistance, we will form an onslaught of the kingdom of God. Look, friends, this is our moment as believers, the week of weeks. And you know what? Hosanna in the highest. Spread the word. Amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We stand to confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers. Prayers of the Church are requested for Samuel Wolf. He's the great grandson of Hugh and Paula Yorton. Samuel was just born this week. We also offer prayers for Dan Malik. Dan's the brother of uh, Pastor Ray Malik and the son of um, the late Bob and Bernice Malik. Dan has been hospitalized uh, downstate with the coronavirus. And we also pray for those who are celebrating this week, those with birthdays, Connor Scott, Liesl Emery, Mark Kuhlman, and also Dave and Willie Ad Adams who are celebrating their anniversary. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Lord, keep your scattered church in your mercy, that she may endure the assaults of the evil one and remain faithful for the sake of those numbered within your kingdom and those who have not yet heard the gospel and been brought to faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, by your spirit, you gather us as your church by promising that wherever two or three are together in your name, there you are in our midst. Do not allow stress or disaster to distract us from the particular vocations into which you have called us to serve in the church, home, and community. Grant to us every gift and blessing needful that we may honor our calling and serve you to the best of our ability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh, mighty Lord, you have established the kingdoms of this world and you hold accountable all those who govern in this and every place. Guide our president, the members of Congress, the governor of our state, and all who make, administer, and judge our laws, that they would serve nobly and wisely, pursuing the path of justice and protecting the citizens entrusted to them. Give them the wisdom and strength needed to bring out our world, bring our world out of crisis and back to stability. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, your grace is sufficient for all of our needs, and you have promised to be the strength of the weary, the hope of those who fear, the healing of the ill, the fullness of those disabled, and the peace of all who are distressed. Hear us on behalf of our nation and the world, suffering this pandemic and isolation. We pray especially for all of our healthcare workers, for those who are on the front lines and who are in harm's way, that you would set your, your veil of protection over them, that you would keep them in your care. We pray for young Samuel and his family. We give you thanks at the birth of this newborn, and we pray that you would keep him safe, especially to the time of his baptism. We pray for Dan Malik and all who are hospitalized with COVID-19. Be with them, strengthen their hearts, and bless the healthcare workers who attend to them. Grant him a full and speedy recovery, Lord. And for all whom we name in our hearts now, Grant that all these be well supplied by your grace in every time of trouble. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, you give food to the hungry and you provide for all our needs in this mortal life. Grant a grateful heart to those who are celebrating this week, for those with birthdays, Connor, Liesel, and Mark, and also for Dave and Willie on the occasion of their anniversary. Keep them ever mindful of your blessings, lest they forget your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. Now, we remain standing, if you weren't standing already, for our sending hymn.